Dear Ecology, faculty, and students, the goal of this video, which I assume that you're watching from the privacy of your office, is to convince you to get out of your office and to show up at in-person academic events. My impression is that attendance of both faculty and students at seminars, receptions, really all kinds of gatherings, fell off a cliff during COVID, and it's just recovering now. But even before COVID, I think attendance was declining slowly but steadily. This isn't just a USU pattern. Most of my colleagues at other universities see the same trend. Now, my, my best guess for the cause of this trend is that we feel ever more pressure to be productive, to publish more papers, to write more proposals, to build ever more sophisticated models. And we perceive a trade-off between attending seminars and receptions and producing all that stuff. Every hour you sit in a seminar is one less hour to work on your paper, right? Well, I want to convince you that this view is fundamentally flawed. It leads to overinvestment in near-term objectives and underinvestment in building the kind of vibrant intellectual community that will sustain your productivity in the long term. In other words, spending too much time alone in your office may ultimately make you less productive. Why should you believe my argument? You're all scientists, you have faith in data, so I'm going to show you evidence from the literature that supports my case. I want to thank my lab members, Michael Stemkowski, Megan Vossen, and Annie Schiffer for helping me to conduct this literature search. They also suggested that I call this a fireside chat. So here's the fire. And here is hopefully the first and only Ecology Center Director's Fireside Chat. All right, we found three lines of evidence to support the hypothesis that showing up at in-person events like seminars, receptions, and workshops increases the quantity and the quality of research outputs. Now, none of these lines of evidence is a direct hit, but collectively, I think they make a solid case. And I'm going to start with the least compelling and work up to the most. Line of evidence number one, I call environment matters. We found many regression analyses in which per capita measures of research output, like publications per year per researcher, are explained using covariates, like the size of an academic department, the amount of teaching required of faculty, promotion criteria, many other factors. But most of these analyses aren't very satisfying, and that's because of the typical correlation is not causation problem. However, some of these papers are more sophisticated and they clearly show that the academic environment in which a researcher is working really does influence their productivity. So here's my favorite example of this kind of paper. Productivity, prominence, and the effects of academic environment. The key quote from the abstract, the characteristics of a work environment are more predictive of faculty productivity and impact than mechanisms representing preferential selection. In other words, you take two equivalent early career researchers, you put them in different departments, and the one in the department with a better environment will go on to be more productive. Okay, so what are the characteristics of the work environment that promotes research productivity? Department size often shows up. Per capita productivity increases with department size. Productivity also increases with the number of PhD students and research staff per faculty member, which isn't too surprising but softer aspects of the work environment like collegiality matter too. A recent review, which you can find listed on the webpage below the link to this video, I've got a bibliography there. This review found that quote, staff who have frequent contacts with other departments and or peers were more le likely to be highly productive. So the take home message from this line of research is that we can work together to create the kind of environment that makes us all better researchers. All right. Line of evidence number two, face-to-face -face interactions are better than remote interactions. With all the technology now at our disposal, why do we even need a local in-person academic community? Why can't we build and rely on virtual communities? Well, the evidence on this one is clear. In-person collaborations are more effective in driving innovation. So here's a recent Nature paper on the topic, remote collaboration fuses fewer breakthrough ideas. And the key quote from this one, researchers in remote teams are consistently less likely to make breakthrough discoveries relative to their on-site counterparts. Another recent Nature paper found that, quote, remote work caused the collaboration network of workers to become more static and siloed with fewer bridges between disparate parts. These effects may make it harder for employees to acquire and share new information.
end quote. A 2009 paper looking at early use of the internet in collaborations found that the amount of face-to-face -face communication contributed positively to all types of productivity. So the take home message here is that remote collaborations are a great way to distribute well understood tasks, but they fall short when we need real creativity. Okay, line of evidence number three, this one's called collective intelligence. And this is my favorite line of evidence, and the one that most directly demonstrates the value of an intellectual community. The basic idea is that none of us is very smart as an individual, but networks of minds working together have great power. So Here's a nice example of this kind of research. It's called, What Makes Us Smart? Quoting from the abstract, contrary to conventional wisdom, human brilliance emerges not from our innate brain power or raw computational capacities, but from the sharing of information in communities and networks over generations. In other words, the popular idea that scientific breakthroughs are generated by a genius working solo in a lab is wrong. Breakthroughs are more likely to come from groups of diverse researchers sharing and combining ideas in novel ways. For example, technology hubs in cities with higher immigration rates produce more patents and citations. This also gets at the fundamental rationale for universities for gathering many bright, curious minds in one place. If you want to hear more about this research, I highly recommend, recommend an Ezra Klein podcast with Joseph Henrik, who was the lead author of this paper, and you can find the link to that podcast again below the video on the webpage. Another flavor of research on collective intelligence seeks to identify the factors that determine why some groups perform more effectively than other groups. It turns out that, quote, having a group of smart people is not enough alone to make a smart group. Instead, the average social perceptiveness of group members correlates positively with group performance. And note that women tend to score higher than men on social perceptiveness. The way that the group interacts also matters. Quote, collectively intelligent groups communicate more and participate more equally than other groups. So together, these three lines of research show that your local in-person academic community is an incredibly valuable resource that you would be crazy not to cultivate and exploit. Investing in the community and reaping its benefits involves the same few steps. Show up, listen carefully, and share your thoughts when it's your turn. Most of the seminars, receptions, and events you go to won't have any direct influence on your research, but all it takes is one interesting question or suggestion, or one mention of a relevant paper, or an introduction to a potential collaborator to set you up for a breakthrough. The more of those interactions you have, the better the chance of a big payoff. You might be able to publish more mediocre papers if you sequester yourself in your office, but getting out of your office will increase your chances of publishing a great paper, the kind of paper that will actually make a difference. So what exactly am I asking you to do? I don't expect you to come to every Ecology Center event. We all have competing demands on our time. We have to make hard choices. So how about coming to more events than you have in the past? Make showing up a higher priority than it was last year. Sign up to meet with visiting speakers and tell them about your research. At social events, talk science with people you don't know in addition to catching up with your friends. I think you will find that getting out of your office is fun, rewarding, and yes, even productive. Thanks for listening.